Well, good afternoon or perhaps it's good morning or good evening, depending on where you were joining us from for a very special patient lounge on the eve of World Obesity Day. Tomorrow, March 4th, marks a very special day for many people who live with obesity, many of our healthcare professionals and our colleagues from IASO and WHO and the World Obesity Federation as it is hashtag World Obesity Day. But here in Europe, it is hashtag Obesity Day Europe because... We've got a lot of events going on. We've got a lot of activity going on, and we want to share all of that with you. Now, every patient lounge, we have panels and we have guests. This patient lounge is a little bit different. We have a lot of activity going on across Europe. Now, I'll tell you a little bit about that in a moment. However, in the meantime, I want to introduce what is coming up on today's lounge. We have three very, very special guests, which got me very excited and quite honoured, to be honest. And here we have, as you can see on your screen, we'll have an interview with Director of Department of Nutrition for Health and Development in WHO in Geneva, and that is Francesco Branca, Branca Dr. Francesco Branca, who I had the honour of actually catching earlier and having an interview with on a busy, busy Friday. Um, we have Kremlin, who has been just a tremendous support to the patient community for the last number of years and worked so hard to connect with us. He is acting head of WHO in in the European Regional Office. And now this isn't last but least, but this is probably my favorite interview because it was the most relaxed interview I've ever done. We're going from WHO Global and Europe to jumping across to Hollywood. And I had the time um, very, very early to have a conversation on the other side of the world with Sam. Now, Sam Hunter is an incredible playwright. He is an award winner and he is an absolute wonderful person. Now, we are on World of ECA Day Eve. You can see there on the screen, we've got the hashtags up. Please use them if you want to get in touch. And if you do want to get in touch, you will see that you can get us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, just make sure that you're actually using hashtag Obesity Day Europe and our comms team can pick that up and let me know what your thoughts are. I can already see some tweets coming through on the screen here, which is great to see. Uh, hello to some of my colleagues that are watching. Hello to some of our partners, colleagues that are watching as well. And some of our partners from industry and various places that are joining us. Now, we will actually record this session and it will be available on our website. So you'll be able to watch it back later. However, none of this would be possible without the support by IASO, our professional scientific colleagues who are the backbone of the work that we do. And of course, our partners who have teamed up with us for World of EC Day, Nova Nordisk, Medtronic, Lilly and Boehringer Ringelheim. Now, what is taking place across Europe uh, tomorrow, really? And I suppose really kicking off today because many events have started to kick off today. And it's exciting times because the obesity conversation is everywhere at the moment. However, the stigma conversation is also everywhere at the moment. And a lot of our challenges are around that. And I'm very proud and honored to say that our colleagues in Italy are doing a tremendous play on this. You'll find information on our website. You can see it there on the bottom of the screen. WODAY.EU. W-O-D-A-Y dot E-U. And you'll find the information on the play that's taking place with our Italian colleagues there. You'll find the information on our German colleagues that have a live national event. Our colleagues in Czech Republic, in Netherlands, uh, in Hungary. You'll find that some of our colleagues in Slovakia and Spain have done broadcasts in their own national language. And then, of course, in Luxembourg and the likes of Ireland and our colleagues in the UK have done their podcast Cast. And all of the information is on our website. So if you want to know what's going on nationally, you'll find it all there. So go there to have a look. But don't go until after this broadcast. Now, it's exciting times as well, because I have been working with Solveig Sigridorti, our president for a number of years. And tomorrow on World BC Day, the Icelandic colleagues up there, the team up there are working hard and they are launching the first patient organization. Not only one patient organization in Europe has been launched, 
We also have Pascal in Belgium launching a wonderful organization to support patients on the ground on obesity, which is quite exciting because we have one more patient organization actually launching. Can you imagine that tree in Europe on World of BC Day? And that is our Hanny and our colleagues in Luxembourg. So it's tremendous that all of this activity is taking place. Now, while I catch my breath, let's actually jump across to the conversation that I had with our colleagues in WHO. Now I had the opportunity to talk to Francesco and have a wonderful conversation around, well, what is the acceleration plan? And, you know, really, what does it mean for patients and people who live with obesity? Is it just prevention or do we have treatment and management in there that we need also? So let's have a listen to what Francesco had to share when I caught up with him earlier. Good afternoon, Francesco. It is tremendous to have you here on our patient lounge. You are very welcome. Now, I'm excited because we talk about, and I just mentioned this to you actually when we were chatting, we talk about on organizational level, the acceleration plan and WHO. But for the average person at home who's sat there on their lunch break right now, listening to this, what is the acceleration plan and how does that impact the lives of people who have overweight or obesity? Well, Vicky, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm leading the Department of Nutrition and Food Safety in WHO headquarters. And clearly, uh, one of our um, important objectives is to try and curb the epidemic of obesity, which has been accelerating uh, uh, you know, at a tremendous speed all over the world, really, uh, now affecting not just high-income countries, but low-income countries. And low-income countries cannot afford to deal with, at the same time, undernutrition and, and obesity. So um, here in WHO, and I'm really grateful, uh, Vicky, for uh, engaging with us, uh, because we've learned a lot also from the patient community. And, and I would say that uh, the dialogue <clears throat> with people living with obesity as informed this acceleration plan. Now, what is this? We have, uh, in fact, it's the World Health Assembly that has uh, indicated that, uh, you know, since uh, the first report that WHO produced on obesity, you know, back in the 2000, you know, in, what has happened in, in over 20 years and what have we learned in this over 20 years? And is there something we can do better? And, you know, somehow, the conclusion was that um, we have learned what are the <clears throat> causes um, um, of obesity. Uh, we have learned that there are policies that can shape better the environment we live in, and that environment is so critical to 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 prevent obesity. But we've also learned that it's not sufficient to prevent obesity. We need to make sure that the whole the cycle from prevention to uh, management of the condition is, is so important. So, so the acceleration plan is somehow taking stock of this understanding and say, hey, governments, you need to act. The reason why we have not curbed obesity is because nothing has happened, because those policies have not been implemented, because health services have not taken this on board seriously and have still somehow, perhaps because of the um, blaming personal responsibility, not accepted that the management of obesity needs to be an integral part of care at all levels uh, of, uh, of, of care. So from primary to secondary to tertiary in an integrated fashion. So, you know, Integrating this, for example, with the management of heart disease, with the management of type 2 diabetes, and, and you know, with the management of, of other conditions, which are the consequence of obesity. And often, <clears throat> as, you, as you taught me, actually, um, people um, are um, diagnosed for their obesity uh, somehow after they've seen uh, a doctor uh, for a heart reason. So it's, it's, it's you know, um, basically an, an afterthought. So the acceleration plan is trying to 
somehow identify what are the critical elements of a strategy to prevent and manage obesity. Sometimes we have made things a bit too complicated. So we said, okay, well, you know, so many different uh, societal factors, so many environmental elements, you know, there are socioeconomic differences, uh, um, there are uh, um, elements related to the early drivers of uh, uh, consumption of food. And, and somehow we've given the impression that addressing obesity is such a, a humongous task that, well, there's not much we can do. And that's exactly the opposite of what we should be doing. We know, for example, looking at the food environment. I mean, of course, the consumption of um, products um, which are energy dense, high in fat, sugar and salt is promoted by the food manufacturers. <clears throat> we need to stop that. We need to curb that. So it's, it's uh, you know, labeling uh, of products uh, uh, in a way that people easily understand. It's uh, curbing the uh, strong, uh, pervasive marketing of food to young children. It's changing the formulation of food. I mean, it's hardly possible to find foods which are not very sweet, for example, for young children. Um, it, it's about um, discouraging the um, use of uh, soft drinks as, as a primary drink at home. I mean, those kind of things are sort of no-brainers. And still, exactly. how many countries have put in place those policies? Very few. So that's what we want to change. And that's the prevention of part. Of course, also the, the physical activity part and making it you know, part of a, of a lifestyle which, which is achievable and affordable by most people. You know, particularly through schools, but through making, you know, safe uh, um, environment, urban environment where work can, can be active. So all of that is part of the prevention. But then the acceleration plan also says, but you need to do something um, in terms of changing the health systems. Yes. Yes. I, but you know, I was going to say to you, I think, you know, I, I love chocolate. I love to have a piece of chocolate every week. Um, I went from binge eating on chocolate to now I literally just have chocolate once a week. And my favorite bar of chocolate is a plain dairy milk bar. It's about this size. And it sits at the eye level of a six-year-old when you walk into a store. And for me, I'm like, why haven't why hasn't even that changed? You know, which is completely wrong. But then when we look at prevention, you know, I think about obesity being, as you said, you know, environmental, socioeconomic, it can be genetic, it can be neurological, can be psychologically impacted as well. And when we talk about prevention, um, I think those early interventions are really key. And one of the frontrunner countries, I know we have uh, Turkey, Slovenia, the UK, but Portugal is doing tremendous work on the prevention side. And when you look at these front runner countries, are you taking like best practice for them and saying, right, we're going to, you know, take this and run with it and put this as a best practice? How are you approaching that? Oh, absolutely. And somehow the frustration has come from the fact that very few countries have actually been able to bend the curve of obesity. But in some um, situations, that actually has been possible. In maybe some socioeconomic groups in some regions of countries. Uh, so you ha we have had some patchy stories of success, but we have had some stories of success. So definitely we need to build uh, on those stories of success. Often uh, community programs uh, are more effective than national programs. Uh, we have also been able to demonstrate now uh, really with a good analysis of the evidence that certain policies produce the impact uh, for which they've been designed. <clears throat> so WHO is actually issuing guidance on marketing uh, food to children, not just making recommendations. Uh, guidance and exactly talking about the situation you mentioned, uh, marketing is not just what appears on TV screens. Uh, now marketing is a lot digital. Marketing is uh, about placement of products, it's about promotion, about price. So all of that, you know, uh, if implemented, does have an impact uh, 
on the consumption of certain foods. We know that uh, tax, uh, you know, putting a tax on sugar sweetened beverages reduces consumption dramatically, you know, and particularly in, in high consumers, as it has been, for example, demonstrated in Mexico, where a tax uh, could uh, bring down the consumption of uh, soft drinks uh, by up to 20% in certain uh, groups. <clears throat> we have seen that uh, uh, clear front of the pack labeling with warning signs uh, indicating that uh, particular uh, foods, uh, usually uh, manufactured processed food, are high in energy or high in sugar and fat. Those warning labels discourage people from um, over consuming those foods. Uh, and, uh, you know, this has happened in Chile, for example, where even young children understand those messages and refuse um, to uh, take those foods that often. So we do have good stories of success. <clears throat> we believe that <clears throat> only if um, a sufficient number of countries um, implement this package of, it's not too many, it's four or five policies at scale for a sufficient time, that will produce an imp a, a result. That's why we use the word acceleration. So yeah. we want to accelerate these processes. It's not possible that after 20 years, we only have, I think, a bit uh, more than 20 countries implementing marketing restriction. Sugar, policy, sugar taxation policies are implemented now in about uh, 80 countries, but um, not with the quality that, for example, is being used in, in Mexico. Even the UK is doing well now in, uh, in, with the sugar levy. So uh, implementing those policies uh, in the right way is important. That's why actually the good practices are critical because we need to learn from, from that uh, uh, action. Yeah, from what has worked. I think for me and for most of the community, when we speak with, you know, ministers for health or, you know, we go to the European Commission and there's conversations, it's like opening Pandora's box when you talk about obesity and you talk about prevention, treatment and management. And I think that's what they feel. It's, you know, it, it is so complex and it, there is no one key solution. But I, I think for us now, as we look at the acceleration plan, we understand it a little bit more and we can see where prevention does work. I think it's really important that people realize that this isn't just prevention, but also I have read through the plan so many times and I see the words treatment and management, treatment and management alongside prevention. And that is key for people like myself, because prevention will work for my grandchildren and my children, but it won't work for me because I have genetic obesity. Um, and so when we look at that treatment, it, you know, is this training uh, primary care levels? What, what exactly does that look like? So uh, I think, you know, there are some countries, again, who has who have been <clears throat> developing excellent approaches to the mm -hmm. management of obesity. Ireland is one of them. Yes. Uh, Canada is another one of them with a with a with a much, um, much better approach, which is really people centered, patient centered where the objective of the treatment are discussed with the patient. And this is not only about reducing weight. This is about uh, helping people live a, a healthy life. It's, it's addressing their uh, <coughs> functional limitations if they are there, and then using the right approach to, um, to address those functional limitations. So, you know, part of it is probably going to be uh, losing weight. Part of it is going to be correcting um, the um, dietary uh, intake and, and, and the lifestyle. Uh, it, in some cases, uh, may require the use of drugs. And, and we have some more um, interesting generation of, of, of drugs, promising, I must say, um, <clears throat> or other forms, uh, you know, including... Uh, um, bariatric surgery or other forms uh, of, uh, uh, of, of uh, okay. reducing, you know, like the, the gushing balloons, for example. Uh, so so the, the management guidelines need to consider the whole spectrum. Of course, dealing with the comorbidities, uh, that, that's absolutely critical. Um, 
you know, we want people to live a, a long and healthy lives. And uh, so, so that, um, that's uh, what uh, I think countries need to reconsider. As part of, of, um, of uh, an integrated de delivery, uh, uh, starting from primary care, some of these measures can be done by people themselves. So there's a self-care aspect. Um, something can be done by the primary care doctor who needs, first of all, to understand the situation. And, uh, you know, we, we, we see that that's, that's, a, that's a limitation and, and needs to have an approach to the patient, which is completely different. It doesn't have to be a judgmental approach, for example. It needs to be in a much more listening mode. And, and then, of course, uh, being able to understand when there needs to be a referral to another level, which is more specialized. And, and, you know, of course, for the more advanced situation that requires sort of more radical treatment, when, when is that needed? So I think, you know, we need really to change a little bit the perspective, mm -hmm. but make sure that the whole system uh, uh, deals with that. And, you know, we have good um, diabetic <clears throat> clinics. Yes. How is the work of the management of obesity interacting with the diabetes clinic do we really have you know a common way to to to, to address the needs of, of the patient so so that's i think you know we need to to induce a change we also need to induce a, um, a, a greater investment <clears throat> we also need to uh, make sure that since um, obesity is a disease uh, you know in its own right uh, it, it needs to receive the kind of uh, uh, public attention and need, needs to be part of uh, primary care benefits uh, as well as other conditions. Uh, we may need to work with private providers. We may need to work with, uh, with the health insurance companies uh, who um, might, on the one hand, provide an incentive to see um, uh, you know, to, to interact with, with the health system. If the health system is you know, willing to take on this charge, of course. So, so it, it has to work on, on, on both sides. And, and so provide that kind of incentives, but make sure that, uh, you know, once a patient uh, decides to um, engage in, in, in the, uh, uh, you know, therapeutic uh, um, path, uh, she or he is supported in doing that. It doesn't have to, you know, always uh, work uh, and, and go up, uh, uphill. Do you know what, can I just say, firstly, thank you on behalf of the patient community for not only giving your time, but for explaining what is ahead for people who have overweight and obesity for generations to come and for not just putting a recommendation out, but creating those guidelines that are just so imperative. And as you said, Ireland, and I'm, I'm quite proud of what is happening now with the model of care in Ireland, taking on the Canadian clinical practice guidelines and the work that has been there that's jointly uh, actually a huge collaboration between not only the healthcare professionals, but the scientific associations and also the patient community ICPO there. So I, I think when we look at these best practices, that this is just the way forward for us. But I'm not going to take up any more of your time, but I do just want to give people um, just a note to, re to remind them that you will actually be speaking on the 9th of March. The Economists have a webinar and it's addressing obesity, overcoming the economic impl implications. And as you spoke about the health system challenges and you'll be there speaking at that with Johanna from WAF as well. So thank you so much, Frank Cesco. I'm, do you know, I'm, I'm so delighted that we, we got your time and I'll let you go back to a busy day and uh, we will speak to you again soon. Thank you very much for the opportunity and in looking forward to this very fruitful and continuous interaction with you and uh, your associates. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Well, you are very welcome back indeed. Um, wow, there was quite some tweets while that conversation was going on. Some questions have popped up from some of our colleagues across the board from France down to Ireland. I'm looking here on the screen. We have some colleagues actually in Belgium who have been on, online saying this is tremendous to hear treatment and management alongside prevention. However, there has been a question that's popped up there on Twitter and the question was around stigma and whether or not 
the colleagues in WHO realise that stigma has been a huge challenge in national policies. Now, I can tell you that I had the pleasure of sitting with my colleague Mario Silva, who has been uh, a joy to work with on the lead up to World Obesity Day as part of our World Obesity Day team. And we sat with our WHO colleagues in Lisbon for three days. And those conversations were had that stigma is such a barrier because it has been embedded in so many of the policies we have seen nationally. And I can tell you now that those con conversations are continuing to be had. And it is something that our colleagues in WHO are trying to ensure does not happen because we know it is a barrier. So bear with us as we get more information on that. Naturally, we will pass these questions over to Francesco and the team and get feedback on them. Now, you can still get in touch, still keep the tweeting going, the hashtag Obesity Day Europe, get online and share what, what you're thinking, most importantly, as I head into this interview now with Kremlin, who we've worked with for so long. Now, I have the fear of saying Kremlin's surname. I think it, think it is. Wick Ramasinghe, I think. the Kremlin, I apologise if I get it wrong. I am hopeless with names, as you know. But in the meantime, let's have a listen to what he spoke about, because we had a conversation not only about the acceleration plan, but how patients can be involved. Good morning, Kremlin. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us on the Patient Lounge, where we try to connect with our patient communities and inform them and empower them. Now, we're excited. We're hitting World Obesity Day shortly. And for our patient communities, they've heard a lot about the acceleration plan. Now, I've just had a conversation with Francesco and we've talked about prevention, which is imperative. We can't just talk about treatment and management. We need prevention. But I wanted to actually ask yourself about the treatment and management aspect of the acceleration plan. And moving on from that, then, how our patients can become more involved and more engaged. So welcome and thank you for taking the time. Thank you, Vicky. Yeah, thank you for the invitation and uh, happy to have this conversation with you. Yes, we, we consider that patients or people, anyone living with uh, overweight obesity can play a big role in both prevention and management components of their plan. It could be global plan, regional plan, or a national level action plan. At all these levels, we need to act on prevention, management, or this area. And their voice is important. How can they be part of? I think the most important part is bringing the reality check into our processes, our planning, discussions, program planning, and evaluations. Sometimes we take actions based on data, and the data we have, but data we don't have tells a big story as well, and that doesn't get captured in these policies. So I think what patients bring is this reality check what are the challenges they are facing is not in the hospital records. And what are the challenges to access those services are not in other records that we take get. And also other uh, cultural barriers and other practical barriers are not in the records we get. So they bring that part and which is in equally important together with evidence to shape programs and also implement them and to improve them. So I think there's always an opportunity at national level, regional level and global level for patient community. I, I think you've actually hit on something that's imperative here because we work with our colleagues in North America and we um, work with our colleagues in World Obesity Federation and we look at culturally how obesity is across the world. But Europe actually culturally people don't realize just how diverse it is. And I think when we look at the acceleration plan, we look at the challenges perhaps in the likes of Slovenia or Turkey in comparison to the UK and Portugal, they're, they're actually quite different, right? Culturally in Turkey, it's, it's incredibly difficult. So how can those patient communities nationally get engaged? Is it, do they work with their scientific organizations? Do they connect with their policymakers? How do we ramp them up to actually engage nationally so we can actually be a part of pushing the acceleration plan? Yes, I think uh, all of those that you mentioned, we want them to uh, engage with the scientific communities and speak at scientific conferences, and, and explain their part of the story and they are asked so the scientific community can also help to shape them and also at policy dialogues and other events. 
So in terms of the cultural aspect, some of those policies, we, we, we face the cultural barriers for implementation. It comes not just for obesity, even tobacco or alcohol. In some countries, alcohol is considered as part of the diet and food. You can't talk about taxing or putting their prices up when people are facing the cost of living prices. Similarly, it can be for school foods or obesity. Parents say these sweets are part of the culture and they have to be given to children. And we see that changing that nature cannot be done just by scientists and science. That needs the voices of the society. And that's where strongly the patient communities can forward to change the norms of the society, especially when we are going beyond the cultural norms in those regions to achieve better health for our children and future generations. Do you know this? I think for many of our patient community is music to our ears, really, because I think the patient stories and the patient experience has been hidden behind a lot of text from, you know, our doctors, our healthcare professionals and that real, true lived experience from a lady in Slovenia or Slovakia to a gentleman in Norway has actually not existed. And for myself and I think for many ECPO members, we've noticed a shift in how WHO is engaging now with the patient community. And like personally, I think a lot of that comes down to yourself and the likes of Francesco and Francesca and and the drive there. And um, how did that shift happen? When did that start to change? Because we suddenly see patients everywhere engaging with WHO and not just as a voice or a seat at the table, but a respected partner at the table. Yeah, I don't want to say it's due to one particular moment, but I think this is a shift that's happening uh, 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 along different disciplines from senior level management to engage with diverse partners, member states, allowing WHO to work with non-state actors and creating a framework for that engagement and having a process. As WHO, we are governed by governments and our, our member states, and then having a clear process to engage with them, we see the value, but also we need a process to do that. And all those things coming together, but also us understanding the value of that for our work, and then we use take that opportunity. And I think uh, we also think there's a huge value of advocacy that, that they can add to amplify the work. The science alone, guideline alone cannot achieve what we want to achieve. And there's a huge role for advocacy. And we know that patients have a crucial role in playing that advocacy for any topic, not just for obesity. And doctors telling patients' experience is different, patients themselves explaining to that. And we need to use all those voices. Healthcare professionals are very important. They need to play that part. Scientists, alongside with the patients and other stakeholders. Well, I listen, I know that you're incredibly busy and I value your time that you've given and you've only arrived home after a hectic schedule and been stuck in storms and airports and everything else. So on behalf of all of the patient community, thank you for giving your voice to World ABC Day and empowering those patients who may not feel that their voice is enough. And I think what you've said should empower them a little bit more to get more active and get more involved. So Kremlin, thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. And thank you for your collaboration and support for all the ongoing activities with WHO and countries. Thank you very much. And you are welcome back. A fantastic conversation and words there from Kremlin. And I think many of the, the comments that I'm seeing popping up here from so many advocates and actually even healthcare professionals are saying, how amazing is it that now patients are a respected partner at the table? And that is crucial. And for me, uh, I'm just delighted that everybody is feeling kind of the same vibe from that conversation with Kremlin, that this is key. This is key to being a part of that multi-stakeholder engagement and long may it continue. Now, I can't go through all of the tweets because I've actually got messages here saying, you know, when is the next interview? And actually it is coming up. So keep your tweeting going. Keep using hashtag Obesity Day Europe. If you're on Instagram as well, I've seen some comments there. Keep it going with the hashtag and ask your comments. However, if you have seen the movie The Whale, you will know there is a lot of controversy around the name of it, some of the scenes in it. 
um, the fat suit worn by Brendan Fraser, you will know that it is a bit of a roller coaster of a movie. Now, if you're a person living with obesity, it may have touched you and affected you in ways that uh, can haunt you, as one of my colleagues said, can haunt you a little bit. However, it is also a tremendous movie that gives you incredible insight and evokes this empathy in somebody that you normally, well, society would push back against. So I had the opportunity to have a wonderful conversation with Sam Hunter, who is the playwright, who through some of his own experiences, actually, he brought this to life as a play over 10 years ago. Now, Sam is a wonderful person. We need more Sams in the world. Trust me, after this interview, you'll know why I said that. Um, but let's have a listen to what Sam had to share when I caught up with him. Good afternoon, Sam Hunter, who is the incredible playwright of this wonderful movie, The Whale. Now, um, first off, you're actually you won an award, actually. And it was only when I was reading earlier, you won an award when this first came out. And it was like, what, 10, 12 years ago. And, you know, 2012, yeah, yeah. Right. And did you at the time, because this is just something from us talking beforehand that I was thinking, did you at the time realize that that award and the essence of this, you know, was going to skyrocket into what it is today? No, I mean, it, 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 you know, my ambitions back then were to, I just really wanted to be an off-Broadway playwright, you know, and so, and and I wanted to write stories that that were kind of uncynical and and I think maybe unfashionable in that way. Uh, and just these earnest stories about, you know, sincere stories about about human beings trying to connect with one another and trying to save one another. And I think that's most of my plays are really about that, about the tragedy of isolation and the value of human connection. But, you know, when I wrote this, I, you know, my husband, then boyfriend, now husband and I were living in like an illegal sublet and, you know, fifth floor walk up, but dodging the landlord. Like, you know, I, it, like I was just writing something that I desperately wanted to write. And so when it was even produced, uh, and it was actually produced in Denver before it was produced in New York. So even when it was produced um, off Broadway at Playwrights Horizons in a 125 seat theater, you know, it was like I, I I did it. I won, you know. And and so everything that's come after that, you know, including like the Drama Desk Award that I got for it, or the Glad Media Award, or um, and now it's becoming a film, which is like this new crazy, uh, beautiful, you know, uh, apotheosis of this, you know. Um, but no, it's 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 been so surprising and and wonderful. And you know, I I've the best part of it too, I have to say, is is like even this morning I got a message from somebody who dug up my agent's contact info and emailed me and just said that she thanked me for the movie because her father struggled with obesity and all of her life she's been frustrated with her father, thinking like just stop eating or just you know, just lose weight. And she said, uh, this movie is helping to repair my relationship with my father. So, I mean, just really like, and I've talked to a lot of people who have that, you know, similar stories. And it's just, it, it, if the movie can do that, then then it's worth everything. One line that really hits that I know came from one of your students. Mm -hmm. um, I need to accept the fact that my life isn't going to be very exciting, which right. hits home with so many people with obesity. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, to your point, I, I, you know, that line that you quoted, I think I need to accept that my life isn't going to be very exciting. That was a line that that uh, one of my students when I was teaching 12, 13 years ago in uh, a state school in New Jersey, uh, in this expository writing class, it was like a required course for everybody attending the university. And so nobody really enjoyed it. <laughs> um, and, and I just found that like teaching them to write an essay became so laborious and, and like they weren't accessing anything truthful they just were trying to give me what they thought i wanted to hear uh and and so i did one day i was just like please just write me like charlie does in the movie i said please just write me something truthful and then a student wrote me that line uh and i think it it hit me for the reasons that that you were talking about too that i you know grew up in the town where charlie lives a small town in northern idaho uh it's pretty isolated i um I didn't fit in when I was young. I, you know, in elementary school, I was a, I was a big kid, uh, um, and I was I was also a very tall kid, a very tall and large kid, and so like people always thought I was five six years older than what I was, and so they were like always looking at me askance. 
Uh, and I just felt like I didn't fit in at all. Uh, like I, I didn't really have friends. I, I would wander around, you know, the playground alone. Um, and then, you know, and if I did like, I, I have a very clear memory of like, one time I was like, I'm just gonna run, I'm gonna run. I don't usually do that. And I started running and I immediately got taunted uh, just for running, you know, like somebody making fun of my size just for running. Um, and so I, so I stopped, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's that vicious cycle, you know, um, and uh, then I, you know, this is going way back, but I went to a, like a fundamentalist religious school because I was having such a hard time. So my parents put me in like the only private school in town, not realizing that I was gay. Um, I was just starting to understand. And so there was like this whole new level of shame entering into that. Um, and then I was, I, I was outed, I had, had to leave. And so, um, and, and all along the while I was still really struggling with my weight, really struggling to find a community. Um, and I think I eventually was saved, if I can use that word, uh, in the things that saved Charlie is like his faith in other people. You know, like I, I went into the arts and I, I started writing plays and I found a community who loved me and accepted me and thought I what I wrote had value, you know, and, and I found value for myself through my writing. And so I think when I began The Whale, I didn't I actually didn't start thinking that it was going to connect to these person, personal issues of mine. I thought I just wanted to write a play about an expository writing teacher trying to connect to a student. Um, so I had a few false starts with it. Like I started writing a play that bears no resemblance to what the whale is now. But then I, you know, uh, kind of took my own assignment and wrote something more honest and dug into those more personal elements and um, eventually realized that I wanted to write a story about a father reconnecting with a daughter which at the time was very theoretical, but now I have a five-year-old kid. So, you know, like making this into a film has this unique new resonance for me uh, on that level too. I, I think like for me, and I know I speak on behalf of many of our community, we are incredibly grateful for how you wrote and portrayed Charlie as an individual um, because he is, for me, the most lovable person. You just want to take him and care for him, which is, so unusual because when you look at somebody who is you know 600 pounds they look unhygienic they look sloppy you know they're gouting chicken and their oil is dripping off their chest and their t-shirt and everything their chin and you're like that is typically what you push back against and that's what society pushes back against they're like you know oh that's a disgusting grotesque person mm -hmm. but yet in this movie he is just the most lovable character and you just want to take him and care for him and I think for me, like, I mean, the movie explores so many different di dynamics, like it is actually so complex, yet it's set in a two bed apartment with what six characters, which is kind of like mind blowing yeah. itself. Right. Um, and we can't ignore that Charlie's obesity is a key component for the story and his journey. But as the writer of the play, where did your understanding of Charlie come from? How did you connect with that because it's very difficult to understand what it's like to have obesity you know and being the quintessential people pleaser all the time with it i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry you know and where did that come from that that blew me away that you got that so easy i you know i mean i mentioned that i used to have a much bigger body and i and you know it was really into my uh i mean i was probably at my biggest when i was in my early 20s just coming out of college um and it was very, for me, like everybody has, 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 you know, bodies for many, many different reasons, you know, and, and people, people with obesity, they have obesity for many different reasons. It presents in many ways. Plenty of people are big and happy and healthy. That wasn't me. I, I, I was using food as a form of self-medication. And I think also as like a gay man, uh, there's a particular shame in being a gay man uh, who who lives with obesity. I mean, I just didn't, could not find a community. I mean, I just, you know, uh, and, and especially like in NYU and where I was in school in the early 2000s, I mean, I just could not find a community. And so I think it became this kind of vicious cycle of like it, the shame led me to, to eat more and more. Um, and, and, and like Charlie, I still have it in me now that I just like apologize on a dime. You know, like I actually, it was, uh, I premiered a play like, six months ago here in New York. And the assistant director came up to me one day and she was like, Sam, you just apologized for passing by me in the hallway. And I had not even 
perceived it. I was like, I did yeah. not know that I did that. And and it, it's just this like, like Charlie, it's just this reaction to kind of go small, go small, oh, you know? Yeah. yeah. And yeah. and I still had that in me. And I think I also, you know, I had the experience of being a larger person who then lost a significant amount of weight. And that, you know, it was good for me because uh, for me, it was uh, having adverse effects on my health. Yeah. And, um, you know, a lot of that, most of it went away once I, I lost a significant amount of weight. But the other thing that happened was like, I realized that the world was relating to me in an entirely different way. You know, like all of a sudden cashiers were nicer to me and like uh, gay men were certainly much nicer to me and much more open to me. And and that was kind of a, a horrifying thing to realize, you know, that that like having walked around in the world with a bigger body, it's just the world relates to you differently. Uh, and I think it forces, you know, for many people, myself included, it just forced me to kind of curl up into this like corporeal apology of just sort of like, you know, um, uh, and and I think Charlie's the same way. So I really just like uh, kind of extrapolated my own experiences and experiences, you know, like like we partnered with the Obesity Action Coalition when we were making the screenplay. And, and so like Brendan got to talk to a lot of people. I got to talk to people like it's just it's been a really, um, you know, it it, do, it did it was rooted in my own experience, but it also I think became much bigger than me. You know, at the end of the day, definitely. I I think part of what I've seen when I went to the screening, when I went back to watch the movie again and again, um, partially because I I fell in love with Charlie, right? I I just wanted to see it again and again, and each time I took away something more from it, and I I think our community over here in Europe is very grateful that you know, there was that engagement with OAC and Obesity Canada. And when I, I did an interview with um, Ian and Patty there the other week for our broadcast, and I've worked with Ian and Patty for years. And I, I said to Ian, I said, you know, do you think this movie is going to be a little bit educational? Because I hadn't seen it at the time. Do you think it's going to be educational on obesity? And he was like, I don't know. The one thing I do know was when I left the theater, I felt like if people had seen the movie, they'd look at me in a more empathetic way. And my gosh, that gave me so much hope, you know, but yet it's getting a lot of pushback as well because we've got these, you know, horrendous and very difficult to watch at times binge eating scenes. Yeah. And it, it was funny because a colleague of mine who has a BC also said to me, he said, um, I don't binge eat like that. And, you know, I don't do that. And I was kind of like, I've done that. Yeah. I, I've, I've been so there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's it's quite personal. And was that your personal experience that you put into it? Because I thought that Brendan portrayed that incredibly well. They were really hard. I mean, they were hard to write and they were even harder for Brendan to perform. I mean, it, it, that was probably the hardest day on set. You know, Brendan worked very, very hard. But, you know, at, at the end of the day, there, there are not in the play script, there aren't Ben shading scenes, um, you know, for, for obvious reasons. I mean, that's I'm not going to subject an actor to that eight times a, a week. Exactly. Um, but but in the film, I kind of and, and, and you know, it. it you know, I've been talking with Darren about the script for the better part of a decade. And so like, we've talked about it at, 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 from every angle possible. And at the end of the day, we were like, I think that if we're going to earn the light, we can't shy away from the dark. You know, I mean, it, it Charlie is like so imbued with hope and faith in other people and, and true joy amidst the sadness that like, that I think we kind of owed it to him uh, to not, shy away from the darker edges of, of his experience, you know? Um, and, and yeah, I mean, again, like, like plenty of people don't binge like that. I happen to be one of the people who did, um, but, but plenty of people don't, you know? And, and like, like, again, like obesity manifests itself in a myriad different ways. I think, I think part of the, I've thought about this a lot of the last few months because of the controversy. I think part of the, the issue is the portrayals of, um, people living in, with obesity and portrayals of like gay people living with obesity are so few and far between. And so like, I think there's this tendency for people wanting it to be everything they want. You know what I mean? They want it to be everything all at once, you know? And, and whereas like, if you, uh, stories about like 
straight guys who have thinner bodies, you have this like buffet of options from from the silliest comedy to the darkest tragedy. And so like you can just you can watch whatever you want. And so I think um, people see it. And if it's not exactly what they want, then it's frustrating to them on some level. You know, but but I hope that, you know, this is one specific person, uh, you know, and, and one specific, you know, experience. It's also reflected in the experience of many, because when we went to the screening in London, um, one of my colleagues from Scotland, Johnny Lamb, he's like this um, wrestler, incredibly intelligent dude who's a young advocate in his 30s. And he's had bariatric surgery and he mm. went from being Charlie and uh, Johnny must be about six foot five, I'd say, you know, this really big guy down to, you know, losing half his body weight. And when we were at the screening, I was kind of I was at one end and I was watching him in the theater at the other end. And I was like so conscious that this would really deeply connect with him. And when I think about it now, what he said to me afterwards was he's going back to watch that weekend with his wife because it actually haunted him that he worried that was going to be his life at some point. Yeah. And it was just, it was so close to home that it really got him. He was emotional when we went outside, but we actually have a, a screening in March next month where we're flying in healthcare professionals and some patients to Manchester in the UK. And they're going to watch it. And I don't know, do you have Gogglebox in the US? You heard no, of Gogglebox? No, I, don't, I don't think so. I've never heard of it. OK, you got to watch Gogglebox. It's absolutely hilarious. It's uh, so it's where people are filmed in their sitting rooms, just watching normal TV, different shows. Oh, and what they wait, I did actually when I was in London for the BAFTAs, I turned on the TV and that was on. So I didn't yeah, know what you're talking it's, about. Yeah, it's, it's really cool because you get like these kind of unexpected comments and everything else. And we're doing that kind of thing with some healthcare professionals and patients. And we're going to show it at the Congress on Obesity, which take place in May in Dublin. And one of my colleagues that's joined us, um, this is partially, for me, I think, going to be incredibly emotional that weekend for him because Andrew is in his 30s. He's a gay man up in Scotland and he is living with severe obesity. And I, I think I want to wrap him up in cotton wool when he goes to the screening because I know he is going to break down in ways that it, it will just touch him, you know. And so when you say it's, you know, uh, that experience is actually an experience of many, many people in our community. And I think they really appreciate, you know, what you've done with this kind of thing, you know. So one thing that we found controversial is the name The Whale. Now, there's also something about it that I did want to say was that you have brought a, a very true and real um, side to obesity to this movie, to your play and to the movie. Um, and yet the movie is the name is so controversial that, you know, was it to kind of a deliberate kind of poke at people's prejudices or, you know, we look at the reference to Moby Dick in it. Where where did it sit? Yeah, the, the, I mean, the, 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 the movie didn't have that title initially or i should say the play didn't have that title initially and even in the first few readings of the play it had a different title but um it was really the at the urging of my fellow writers who i you know, like in writing groups when i was bringing it to them that that because it always had the moby dick uh theme throughout that was always part of it uh and and at a certain point my my colleagues were like no it's about exposing people's prejudices that at the, when they hear what the play's about and when they start watching the play so many people in the audiences are, are going to bring that kind of prejudice you know the kind of prejudice that i you know i got called that when i was young like it, it i didn't want to title it that either but you know at, at a certain end of the, at the end of the day i was sort of like i can't pretend that this isn't one of the last bastions of socially acceptable prejudice in our society, you know, um, and, and but but, it, you know, of course, the, the title means something altogether different by the end of the, the movie. Yeah, Chino, I, I love that. For me, when I came out, I was like, I didn't expect the Moby Dick team. I did mm -hmm. not expect that. That kind of hit me. And I, I spent a lot of time thinking about it. Um, you know, I used to call myself when I was pregnant. And at that stage, I was what? Pregnant my first child. I was the best part of. Mm, 200 kilos and I used to call myself a beach whale you know and you know I say oh I'm I'm sorry you know I look like a beach whale you know I was I was so embarrassed and ashamed so it, it kind of hits home a lot but the one thing I did want to kind of get to um and this is more for personal reasons than anything yeah. else really is 
you know, I, I've gone to many plays when I've gone to New York and I've, I've taught about different plays I've seen. And when I was thinking about this, I was like, how on earth did you feel when this was coming from your play where you had this really honest person that you wanted to protect in the play, Charlie's character, to cinema? How did you think about that opening up? Because for me, I, I've i watched on YouTube the various clips of the play when it was out and the characters and Liz in it and everything. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, they really brought the play to cinema. It's, you know, it's incredible. But were you worried about how Charlie would be perceived? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I you know, I felt so protective of this. And there's something about the theater. The theater is such an invitation to kind of like, you have to be like very deliberate when you go see a play you can't like pull up a play on your iphone and, and yeah. watch it you know like like it's a very different kind of experience and i was worried about it in a number of different reasons i mean like I, i've worked on several different productions of the play and what i love about playwriting is like they were uh, plays are ephemeral you know they, they happen in this place and then they go away productions go away and and like they live only in your memory and like you know like videotape plays are never 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 like the actual experience um so you know when darren approached me about making it into a film i i was concerned because it does come from such a personal place and i feel so protective of charlie um but it was really evident early on that darren and i were thinking about it in the same way and especially i i did i felt strongly before i even said anything to darren i felt strongly that you shouldn't open it up because the the, the experience of the story is being with this guy and the, like he can't leave his apartment uh darren wanted to do it initially and so i knew he was the right guy to do it i, I had talked to different directors over the years uh and none of them wanted to be faithful to that aspect of it like like darren did um so uh from then it was like i i felt like you know, I, I and and he also wanted me to adapt it. He didn't want anybody else touching it, which was a real gift too. Um, and uh, and from then it was like, well, who are we going to find to to play this guy? And and again, like the play has been done so many times by so many really gifted actors who all bring something unique to it. And but there's a permanence to a film that made me nervous because uh, it's like this is going to live on forever, you know. Uh, unlike a play, but but when we we organized a reading actually like a few weeks before the pandemic hit, and Brendan did did a reading of it as one would do a reading of a play, and from the very beginning, like you could just see the amount of empathy and love and joy amidst the deep sadness that he was bringing to it. It was just it was so gratifying, you know, uh, exactly the right pitch being struck by Brendan. I, I can't fathom how emotional it must have been for you to be there watching Brendan bring this character to life. Haven't seen it on, you know, stage and theatre, but then it's it's gone to a whole new level now. So, you know, on behalf of patients across Europe, you know, I'm just very grateful that you chose to protect the character so well, Charlie, who now we all love and want to care for. And uh, just grateful that you gave us our time, your time. So uh, thank you yeah. so much, Sam. Thank you so much for having me. This was so wonderful. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. I will speak to you again soon, I hope, in the future. Yeah, I hope too. All right. Well, there you have it. Um, yeah, wow. I'm reading the comments and people are quite surprised. A lot of people are quite surprised that Sam Hunter was actually that bigger kid and he had some of his experiences and they're saying, I can see the link now between Idaho and the movie. And if you haven't seen the movie, now you got to watch it. And the, the young missionary and how Sam Hunter really understood what it was like for Charlie, especially with the binge eating and the gorging on food and things like that and how he was using food. And it was, it's just... It's a hard watch if you haven't seen it, but it is a tremendous watch. And for myself, I truly hope that, you know, this continues to be something that will evoke empathy in people as time goes on. Now, we actually don't have uh, much more time and I'm looking at all the comments and we are incredibly grateful. We will respond on Twitter and Instagram and on Facebook. I can see there actually on LinkedIn as well to some of the comments. There's no way I'll get through them all, but thank you so much for giving your time. Please, please, please share your support for World Obesity Day. Use the hashtag Obesity Day Europe. Use the hashtag World Obesity Day. 
And if you can, hashtag addressing obesity together, because effectively that's what this is. We are all addressing obesity together to change the lives and improve the lives of people who have overweight and obesity. World Obesity Day is tomorrow. Get online, share your support, make sure that you're engaging with people and sharing their work so that people that we don't normally get in contact with are contacted. Now have a wonderful weekend, most importantly, a wonderful World OBC Day, and we will catch you on the very next episode of The Patient Lounge. Adios.